One of the first things that I look for on these tests is always the, the uh, inorganic to organic nitrogen. And that's directly under the H2O there. There's a column that says organic N to inorganic N, okay? That's telling us the nitrogen that's in the soil the day this test was taken, uh, what was the ratio of organic to inorganic? And remember, Brady talked about this this morning, about how the inorganic form is mineralized. It's available to the plant. The organic form is tied up, either in plant, a growing plant, residues, etc. Just the, yeah, the Haney ones, if you just put them uh, one on top of the other. So one of these has a number of 1.94, the other has a number of 0.14. Well, what does that mean? You want a number greater than one because you want your nitrogen more in the organic form than the inorganic. Because the inorganic, although it's available at that minute, it's prone to loss, okay? So a number of 0.4 on the one is extremely low. I mean, I, it's not often I see numbers that low. Now, slide over on that column to the very left, the column on the very left where it says nitrate parts per million. Okay, one has 4.8 parts per million. The other sample is 150 parts per million of inorganic nitrate nitrogen, okay? That's water soluble, that's going to leach away if you get moisture. Now I wanna tell you the difference in these two fields. Uh, both these fields have a growing crop on them that will be harvested any minute, okay? If you saw a soil test with 150 parts per million of nitrate nitrogen and you're headed into fall, what would you do with that field? <laughs> Plant something immediately, because chances are you're gonna lose that by spring. In saying that, uh, I will guarantee you the owner of that field is not gonna do a thing. Let me tell you the history of that field. That field, well, okay, I'll be honest, happens to be my neighbors. And this will be the first crop he's harvested in three years. But he's fertilized each of the past three years as if he was gonna get a crop. We had two major years of drought. Now this year, where he's gonna have a harvestable wheat crop, not a bumper, but a wheat crop. But look what I'm saying. He has dumped copious amounts of, of nutrients onto there and he's letting them disappear, basically. Now, they haven't all leached away the last two years because we've just been that dry. Uh, last year, we had 5.6 total inches of precip. The year before was 6.2, okay? This year, we, we, haven't, uh, we haven't hit six yet. We're at 5.9, but... So, excuse me, I gotta ask the gentleman from Ward Lab. I'm sorry, I forgot your first name. Patrick. Have you seen that high of nitrate, nitrogen numbers? Yeah, isn't that amazing? I mean, but right, that guy needs to be seeding something as soon as he combines that wheat, or he's gonna lose that with any kind of snowfall this winter, yeah. So does everybody understand that? You know, I mean, that's pretty simple. That is astonishing. I hadn't seen a test that, that high. Now, Next thing I look at is down in the second column, organic matter, soil organic matter. Uh, it's under other soil measures, right-hand side of that block, soil organic matter, the one sample's 5.4, the other's 2.6. Both of these are no-till soils. The one's been no-till for, for 28 years, the other one for 10 to 12. Okay, major difference there. That tells us, obviously, more carbon available, correct? S soil pH, not much different on the left there. 
I slide down then under the soil health scores and I always look at soil respiration. 228.8, so that's the CO2 burst that Brady talked about, kind of similar to Solvita, CO2 burst. 228 is a pretty good number. We like to see numbers above 200 there. But look at that other one, 21.8. That soil is pretty much dead, you know. There's just not a lot of life in that soil, okay? Then I always like to look at MAC, M-A-C. That's microbially active carbon. That's how well the biology likes the food it's being given. So you've got one at 70.3, another at 12.7. We would like to see numbers, but somewhere between 50 and 75 there. So on the one soil sample, the biology is going good. Jolene's happy, it's a diverse diet, fruits, vegetables, a lot of meat. Oh, sorry, I had to throw that one in. No fish. Yeah, no fish, yep. But the other one with the score of 12.7, all that's in that refrigerator is Brussels sprouts, okay? That biology is not liking that food that's there. Probably just pizza. <laughs> Probably just pizza, yeah. <laughs> Probably. So, now this is how we use this test to help guide our clients. And Abby Brady, if you have anything you want to interject, by all means, or you, Patrick, I don't, everybody interject, that's fine. We go to the nitrogen comparison, okay? The heading nitrogen comparison. So your traditional soil test would tell you that there's 8.7 pounds available on the one. But the Haney test is gonna say, because of the biology in the soil, how active it is, you really have 58.7, will have 58.7 pounds available throughout the growing season. So that's a difference of 50 pounds. So by taking this test, we're, say we are on a new client's farm, we're gonna immediately demand they do a check strip using 50 pounds less, assuming they were using recommended uh, rates before, 50 pounds less. And that's how we get them comfortable. You know, 50 pounds of N per acre is a considerable dollar savings, right? Now on the other soil test, traditional test said 270 pounds, which is just an astronomically high number, okay? But it's due to the conditions of the drought and over fertilization. Even on this one, the Haney test is going, even though this soil is not very alive biologically, it's not mineralizing well, you're still gonna get an additional 28 pounds. So that's how we start backing people off on these inputs. And we do it in their context, what they're comfortable with, you know? And that's gonna vary from person to person. Some people will only try it in a test strip. Others are gonna say, no, I'm gonna split the field in half, do half on each, you know? And we'll, we'll, we always prefer a zero check strip also, you know, just to show people and to document how their soils advance. Those are the things, obviously there's other things we can talk about, phosphorus, I didn't look at the soluble, oh, there's one. Okay, other soil measures, look at that column on the, the one test with the high nitrate nitrogen. Soluble salts at 0.82, that's really getting high. <laughs> They're gonna have an issue, and that's coming about from all the synthetic fertilizer. They're having a negative impact on soil biology there with that high salt in those soils. Mm -hmm. They're gonna have issues there. Yeah, so what would I do if I was consulting my neighbor? <laughs> well, first I'd have to talk to him, I guess, but uh, that was a joke. We talk, just not very often. Just not about anything farming. Uh, what would I do on this? I'd immediately go in and get a crop established, even if it meant putting winter wheat in, because this, this individual has never seeded a cover crop. So what do they feel comfortable with? Cash crops, they've grown wheat. They, they grow a rotation of wheat, corn, and beans. Well, I'd, I'd go in with winter wheat. I'd get something growing there. Otherwise, he's gonna lose that nitrate nitrogen. 
Then after that winter wheat crop is harvested next year, we'd have to go in there with the diverse cover crop species and jumpstart soil biology. Because uh, with the CO2 burst to 21.8, there's not much, not much alive there. Questions? I went through that very fast, but Mark? Okay, yeah, sampling. So the Haney test, uh, they prefer, you see in the upper right, sample depth, zero to six. They prefer it in that zero to six zone. Now, depending on the size of the field you're taking it in and depending on variations in soil types, as Abby said yesterday, we would probably want to sample those different soil types. We just, for our clients, we will sample different soil types, but it's a composite sample. Okay, so we're going out into a quarter, say it's a quarter and there's two different soil types, you know, which is pretty rare, usually there's 10, it seems. You know, usually there's a lot of variability. But we'll go out in there, take the major couple of soil types and pull 20 to 40 cores for each of the samples. Mix them together, send it in, and you simply need a, a quart size bag or less for that one. And uh, uh, the PLFA test, that other test I sent the sample around, that's the same depth, zero to six inches. Uh, don't go much deeper than six. If you do, mark it on there so they know, because it'll make a difference in the calibration of that. Mix it up. Yep. Send it off. I, uh, we like overnighting it. Yeah, getting it there. Sometimes put a cooler pack in there, but that doesn't necessarily have to be done. When to take the sample? We prefer to sample adequate time before. Soil temps need to be 50 degrees or above, okay, to get a meaningful test. We like taking it before seeding, if possible, because if you take it in the fall, it's gonna change by spring, soil's living. So we prefer to take it in the spring. Now I realize for a lot of the small grains, soil temps aren't at 50 degrees, but uh, hopefully we can go in and uh, um, apply post-seeding some of the nutrients, okay, if, if it's needed. You can still put down part of a starter if you want, but then go back, top dress the rest after soil temps are at 50 degrees. We prefer, you know, in this environment here, it'd be sometime in May, we'd be pulling soil samples, late April, May, depending on weather. Okay. Then moving to the PLFA analysis, just very briefly on that one and what we look at there. We do these in combination. We do not do the PLFA every year. We do it approximately once every three years. The main factors we're looking at that Okay, right under PLFA analysis report. Total biomass, that's in nanograms per gram, 5,591, okay? That's a pretty good number. There's a lot of microbial biomass in this sample. Right underneath that, functional group diversity index. That is a, a index number that tells you how diverse the species are that make up that number of 5,591. Uh, 1.45 is a high number. Now you can go on, uh, Ward Labs has on their website a, um, how to read these, correct? Yeah, yep, the yep, the Ward Guide. Okay, you heard that here. Thank you. Now we go down, sliding down the chart, you see bacteria numbers, you see fungi numbers. I really like to look at their muscular mycorrhizal fungi. And over there, percent total biomass, 5.71, that's a really good number. It means there's a lot of mycorrhizal fungi. Remember, uh, I talked about it, Brady talked about it, how mycorrhizal fungi secrete a glue called glomalin, which is a sticky substance that bind sand, silt, and clay particles together to form aggregates. That's missing in a lot of cropland, <coughs> excuse me, cropland systems. So that's a very good number. 
Now we go down, slide down a couple more, and we see protozoa, a number of 0.33. Uh, that might seem really low. It's actually not too bad. It's, it could be a lot better, but protozoa are the predators that eat the bacteria that help drive the nutrient cycle, okay? Remember when Brady talked this morning, he was using the example of bacteria that were a five to one carbon to nitrogen ratio, and I believe he said protozoa were a 10 to one. So they're gonna need to eat two bacteria to meet their carbon needs, but they're gonna have an excess nitrogen, which they crap out the back, and that's the start of the nitrogen cycle, okay? So we need to see that. The vast majority of cropland acres we test have very little protozoa in it. We, it's because of a lack of diversity. Then you go into the upper right there, community, fungi to bacteria, that's a ratio of fungal component to bacteria. This one's 0.1946. That may seem real low, but if you're at about a 0.25, you're at a, about a one-to-one -one ratio, the way this test is. So that number is not too bad. But we can use this number to deter, help us determine, okay, what's the diversity of the biology at when we're starting working with this client? Do they have the protozoa? Uh, do they have the mycorrhizal fungi? And, uh, you can also use this test. You can glean a number of other, of other factors off of it, but that's what we use and look at. Again, about once every three years, but certainly on the initial consultation with a client. And I didn't copy off a total nutrient digestion test. That's another one we do with all the clients. That's the one that uh, shows both the inorganic and organic fraction of these nutrients in your soil. And like I told you yesterday, we have never on nearly 33 million acres, we have never tested one that's deficient in anything, you know? So ask your agronomist to explain that one to you, okay? You're not deficient in nutrients. Your soil's deficient in biology. Well, you may be deficient in nutrients, I don't know. Obviously, I'm sitting pretty good, but, right?